I'm Paul Conroy, I'm a photojournalist. Um, I've covered conflict for 25 years. And at the time, Syria kicked off. When we got there in 2012, I was on assignment with Marie Colvin with the Sunday Times. Um, I'm Edith Bouvier, I'm a freelance journalist. And it was my second time I went to Syria when we met together in Homs in February 2012. And I was with uh, William Daniels, photographer, and Remy Oshlik, photographer too. And in terms of your careers, more generally, before we focus on Syria, uh, is have you have experience um, covering war zones and as a photographer, naturally, and as a... Uh, I've been covering war zones since years. Uh, and I was focusing focused on, on Middle East since 2007. And I worked on all the spring uh, wars since the beginning, since Tunisia, Libya, and, and then Egypt, and then uh, Syria. I missed Egypt. Okay, I started off um, in the Balkans in 1999 covering the conflict in Kosovo. Um, after Kosovo, I covered um, the, the Iraq invasion. Worked a lot in Central, Central and Eastern Africa and the Congo, as well as um, Libya and, the, and the, all of the Arab Spring from, from then on in, really. And then in relation to Syria specifically, when did you arrive and what were the circumstances uh, prior to the attack in February 2012? Um, I arrived... Um, with Marie Colvin. I had gone into Syria a few weeks earlier with another con um, correspondent from the Ta Sunday Times, Miles and more, but we only got about three days in when um, we were rushed out because apparently the, the regime got word that we were in the country and we, were, we, we had to get out quickly. They were coming for us. Um, I then went in with Marie on in early February. Um, and from the beginning, we knew that there was, um, there was going to be quite a different um, working situation from other conflicts. We, we spent some time with Lebanese intelligence officers in Beirut. And before we left to go for the border, um, we were informed that they'd picked up radio traffic on the Syrian military network and that they'd heard them issue orders that any journalists caught or captured in or around Homs were to be executed immediately and have their bodies thrown on the battlefield and make it seem as if they'd been caught in crossfire. So, so even before we left to go into Syria, we knew that the, the situation was going to, be, going to be particularly difficult to work in. Um, you know, the, the people we went in with, we spent a long time establishing communications because we, we didn't want to go in with visas. We didn't want to be part of the regime kind of press tours around the hotspots. So we were going in through the Bakar Valley over the mountains and heading towards a town called Al Qazir initially um, with, the, with the idea of getting to Homs because we knew um, the 4th Division had Homs surrounded and we could see by the, the live streams that the, the, the regime were intent on reducing Homs to rubble. So we had to go in illegally. <coughs> um, and by the time we got to Al, Al Qazir, um, and we covered two protests. That was one of our first jobs we did there was in Alcazir. And we saw anybody with, with their phones out taking pictures or with cameras. The, the regime forces were, were kind of just snatching them and, and, uh, and taking them. So it was really, it was incredibly difficult to just be there, let alone operate and take photographs and, and work as, as press. And we certainly didn't identify ourselves as press. You know, on all of all of the um, everyone we were with said, "Do not, you know, try and keep your faces covered, keep your cameras hidden, because the the threat was there already." And they gave us numerous examples <coughs> of local activists and Syrian journalists who'd been taken and disappeared, and uh, you know, and the most popular things of um, to do was to gouge their eyes out. You know, that was the the punishment, and we saw a lot of documentary evidence for that. 
if you're caught taking pictures at the protests of, or of the forces, then you know that's the price you'll pay. Um, so yeah, just incredibly difficult. You know, as 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 journalists, you need to be amongst people. You need to be talking to people, and to identify yourself was was asking for trouble. So it was it was a very difficult way of working. Um, getting to Homs again was incredibly difficult. We were in regime controlled territory. So every journey was um, was a roll of the dice. We travelled in the backs of trucks on motorbikes, mostly at night, um, to get to a town called Albueda, where we we met up with elements of the by then fledgling Free Syrian Army, who were, were very much a defensive force at that point. You know, they were just looking after people at the protests, looking out for them, um, and we we stayed there for three days. And then we had to go through a tunnel. The, it was the only way into Homs because the, the 4th Division had it sealed. They took us through a three-kilometer underground tunnel, which, which um, led from under the blockade, under the military forces, and we ended up coming up in Homs. Again, Homs, Gilles Jackier had been killed about a week and a half, half before. So again, we knew that as journalists it was going to be a difficult difficult place to operate you know the, the circumstances surrounding his death are still you know still open for debate the regime said not but you know we knew from the activists that we'd communicated with inside that you know working as journalists inside Baba Amra the neighborhood we're going was going to be incredibly difficult um, and when, once we got in it was uh, it was nigh on impossible to operate anyway. The, 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 the artillery bombardment was so intense um, on a daily basis. And this was, you know, this wasn't a military stronghold. This was a civilian community getting shelled by wide area battlefield weapons. Um, and again, just leaving the building to take pictures was, was one of the most dangerous things you could do. The media center there had already been targeted. The top, it was a three-story building, and, and I think it was about four or five days earlier, the regime had shelled the media center and removed the top floor. So it was already damaged. Um, their cameras that they had set up for live streaming had been sniped. The snipers had hit them because they were putting information live on the internet. Um, so again, it was just another example of the media being targeted and prevented from work, and you know, which I assume was their was their sole intent. The regime's sole intent was to control the information. If you can control the information, then you can work in the dark, and you know that's exactly what these people like to do. They like to operate in the dark, and then people come along and start poking their noses and cameras in, and telling the world. Then you know that's that's the opposite of what these people want. We're going to go back to that, but I want to listen to Edith just okay. to blockade chronologically both of you in Syria, please. please. Uh, I swear I will not be so long as him. Um, sure. <laughs> it was my, as I said before, it was my second trip to Syria. I went there in November, December 2011, but I went to the northern part, uh, northern and western part in Idlib area. So I, I already witnessed the difficulties of the citizen journalists there. How did they cope to try to find internet, to try to find a way to um, explain the word was, what was happening in Syria at this time. Uh, the Free Syrian Army was just in, in its beginnings and the, the um, civilians were trying to organize themselves. So it was the beginning of what happened, what, what's happening now. And then we went back to France and went back to Syria in begin mid of February. We were supposed to go back to Idlib area, but uh, in, in Istanbul, our friends told us that it's, there is a way to go to Homs. And at this time, as Paul said, a lot of foreigners journalists were there trying to um, to make stories about what was happening to the civilians because the border was 
much uh, open than than before. So it was possible. There, there were way for us to go there. So we changed our tickets to Beirut, and we stayed there around 10 days trying to find the right contacts and trying to ensure that everything will be fine when we will enter the, the city. To explain the way we enter a, a city and a territory under the control of the regime, we have to explain that it's under the, the, the ends of the Syrian activists who are in total control of what's happening on the ground. Me, I was completely blind. They told me, OK, you, you will take the bus up to this station, then you will wait for someone. And then from one point to the other, we were uh, waiting for the final answer for their checkings on the roads, if it was OK, if the regime was still controlling, if we can go further. And those kind of activists were trying to open the, the way for the journalists, to try to find a way for the journalists to tell about the, the truth in Syria. So I would like to thank them, because I think that when we are talking about the citizen activists, about the journalists, we forgot a lot of Syrians who gave their lives for let us do our work. So, okay. Um, so, one day the Syrians told us that it was okay, that they found a way for us to enter homes. And at this time, we met on the road uh, with Jean Paul Perrin, Jean Pierre Perrin, sorry, a French journalist, who told us that the city was under siege, that we shouldn't go there, that the regime was trying to catch all the journalists. But we were not listening. Uh, even if I think that we were right and if we, we had to go there, we were not listening. So we went to the tunnel, as he said, and we arrived to the MIDI center just the night before. I, I couldn't say anything about homes at this time, about the shillings and everything, because we arrived a few hours before the last shelling started. Perfect. That was my next question. Can you now describe the media center and how many journalists, I suppose from many nationalities, were at the time? And a little bit the description of the siege and how it um, got closer to the media center of the attack. I think you should describe the siege and the city, and I will describe for the journalist. Okay. Um, the media center was, it's a very grand description. It was actually a house and the bottom floor. Um, you go in and there was a main room where most of the people were and there were some back rooms um, used for storage and for sleeping in. Um, it, was, it, was just, it was just somebody's house with a satellite dish that they got up to allow communications. Operating out of it, I'd say there were between 20 and 30 um, local activists. Um, when we got there, there were the only foreign press still in in homes were Arwa Damon and Tim from CNN. Everyone else had left at this point um, when me and Marie arrived. It was, at that point, it was constant. Um, the, the, the siege was, was really biting the, the shelling. Um, every day, the regime would start at one end of the neighborhood and shell, and then change the positions, and then shell the next piece, and then shell the next piece and they just go up and down all day, moving about to get into the media centre or out to the field hospital, which was the main, the main other place that they, the press worked in. That was, um, that was rolling the dice. You'd get in a car, you would drive like crazy because they had snipers on a lot of the tall buildings. So if the shelling wasn't going to get you, then the snipers would, would have a go at you. Um, it was the, the you know the the young Syrian guys. They were the they were the guys who went out to the very front where the tanks were trying to punch punch through, um, and you know they took their lives in their hands. I went out a few times with them, but they these guys did it all of the time. You know that's that that's they were the world's eyes and ears into Homs. So I mean the worst conditions existing in Homs at that time are the worst I've covered. What twenty five years covering war, and I've never been in anything like that. When when that shelling was happening, it was like it was hell on earth. 
Uh, we arrive uh, in the same trip as uh, Remy Oshlik, as I said before, William Daniels and me, and all, also Javier Espinoza, a Spanish journalist, but he managed to escape quickly after the bombings. So, yeah, we were four new journalists, and uh, Marie Colvin and Paul were already there. And with them, I think that at this moment, only four or five citizen journalists were working uh, in the media center. Yeah, I think I, th I think it varied, but, you know, some days yeah. it would be ten. You know, it, they, were, they were out doing it, so it, it varied a lot. This exact night, just a few of them, but as you said, the place were really small. We were also forced to live all together in the same uh, living room, so there were no real space for the others. And moreover, the, the other Syrians were living nearby and just coming to use the internet connections to send them, them reports. So they were not only international, they were also Syrian yeah. journalists in the center. Could you describe the attack in which um, Eric and Mary lost their lives? There is no way to describe an, an attack when you are in the exact place targeted. There is no words to describe because, moreover, because he is better than me to, to analyze military things, but we were sure that uh, four shillings targeted the, the building, but according to the UN database I've uh, been able to, to notice, that only two finally uh, bombed the, the house. But the, I'm, I'm not trusting the UN anymore since a long time. Um, that's another issue. Um, so we've been a lot of uh, under a lot of uh, uh, attacks, but this particular one, I think that the Syrian understood uh, uh, faster than me that it was targeting, targeting the media center exactly. So I don't know, but I. I I needed maybe two, five seconds to uh, uh, decide if I will take my bag or no, if I will run, if I will stay, what should I do? And I saw Marie and Remy uh, uh, running to the entrance of the building, trying to escape. I was not so fast. Thanks for me. Th those five seconds uh, I needed to think about my future in this area because if I didn't took my laptop, my um, recorder, I would be use useless to record the voices of the civilians. So I was thinking about all of that when the shelling finally fall into the house. And I don't know how I managed, but I, I, I form under the, the, the floor, I was just under the, the table. I didn't notice there, was a, there, were, there were a table before. And um, first, the, the place was completely gray. There is smoke everywhere. You can't see everything, anything. And you can't hear anything neither. So I was trying to call William and, and Remy, even if I knew that Remy was not there anymore. So, and I, I don't know if it's because of the movies or whatever, but I tried to see if my fingers and my feet are still moving. Um, I noticed that everything was okay, but I tried to wake up. And then I noticed that there is a, um, a large pool of blood next to me, and it was mine blood. Thankfully, uh, William arrived at this exact moment because it was starting to be painful, but I, more of it was threatening because I can't move anymore. I can't see anything. I can't hear anything because the, my hairs were, were just blocked. My heart was uh, shaking. And a uh, few minutes later, I found myself in the bathroom where I found uh, Paul also. And that's where the nightmare started. Paul? Yeah, I mean, God, it's kind of strange hearing it from 
I've spent we, we never spoke about no, it together. I've spent a lot of years talking about it on my own, but I've never listened to it like that. So, yeah, it was quite harsh. Um, same, you know, it was very early in the morning. We'd woken up um, to the sound, and you know, I'm I'm quite. This is one of my sticking points. I know that that attack wasn't an accidental shell, and you know, there's. I was in the artillery before I became a journalist, and my job was to call fire missions in, which was exactly what was happening to us. Um, I was the radio operator who used to control the shells. So when we heard two shells land about 100 metres either side of the media centre, I was, I, was I was worried. And then 30 seconds later, another two shells landed 50 metres closer. And at that point, I understood that's a technique called bracketing. It's where they look, fire shells, make adjustments, shells come closer. And after two lots, I knew the next lot was going to hit the, hit the media center and then all hell let loose. And as either said, it was just when the shells hit the building, it was absolute chaos. You know, people were, you know, Marie Remy tried to get out and, and they made it to the door. And that, and that shell that landed killed them instantly, and that's what that's what got us. I was si very similar to Edith. I got was on the floor, and I didn't know if I'd been hit or not. And I I kind of touched my leg, and my hand went inside my leg and partially outside, straight through. And I had to put a tourniquet on quite quickly. Um, and I, and I put tourniquet on went crawled a little bit to look for Remy and Marie who were who were now outside because the building had gone that part of the building and they were quite obviously dead and uh, then they started shelling again I think there was a drone watching the rubble and when they saw my movement or the movement of people outside, then they started shelling again. And I think it was for another five, it's hard to remember the exact timings, but it was about another 10 minutes of shelling where we all had to stay stay in the rubble. And um, my leg was really bleeding badly, so I had, to, I had to tie another tourniquet on with an ethernet cable that I found. Um, and then after 15 minutes, they, you know, they, they were trying to get, they got a car, didn't they? They got a car and brought it round into the street and they, they put both me and Edith in the car and on top of each other and kind of took us to the, to the field clinic where they then started the treatment. But at that point, the media center was completely out of, out of order. It was destroyed and all, all our cameras, laptops, everything, everything was gone. And, um, and yeah, and that's really when the nightmare began. Do you want to elaborate on, on where the nightmare yeah. began? Oh, I'm, I can do a good elaborate nightmare. It was, um, they, they got us to the, the, I mean, now I say the field hospital, they, you know, that's another grand description. It was a few rooms with a few, with a few beds, with, with, make, with first aid kit, basically. There was no, you know, forget any concept of a hospital, as you know, it wasn't that. It was do what we can. Either they... I saw Edith's leg was fractured as well as punctured, and they had a. I kind of remember laughing. It wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't funny, but I do remember laughing because they had all these bottles of water tied up with bits of string, tied up to make a traction system for Edith's leg, and my leg. They were trying to trying to close this hole, and I just remember we we laid together holding hands, kind of wondering what was happening. Um, while our translator, his arm had been fractured, and they had not, we had no anaesthetics really, so they, he was just biting on a piece of wood while they, while they set his arm. And so it was just this kind of insanity where they were trying to stabilize those of us who had lived. And, and, and they were like, you know, you can't stay here in the, in the field hospital. So they transferred us. After a few hours, they transferred us to a, a room further down the street, um, and they put mattresses up against the wall, up against the windows to stop the glass coming in. And so we, we Edith had a mattress, I had a mattress, and Whale had a mattress. And it was just a dark room with one oil lamp. Um, and then it started. They, they, I think they, the regime had found out where we were, 
And then for the next four or five days, they just unleashed hell on on uh, particularly on that building. Um, they 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 knew some of us had survived, and they wanted to finish the job. Um, and it was it was an attempt at really just just getting to that building. They were they they had tanks that were trying to knock the buildings around us down, just blow them up. And and they were shelling. You know, we were taking so many direct hits, and it was a good job. It was a strong building because we took so many direct hits with mortars and artillery rounds that I'm surprised the room lasted as long as it did. But at one point, and this was the probably the worst point is we got a message through saying there was going to be a ceasefire and that we were going to be rescued by the Red Cross. The Red Cross were coming in, which, and they, and they came, you know, the, the, we heard the ambulance. There was a, the first ceasefire, I think, that had ever happened. And so we were kind of very, you know, we were, we were happy. We thought this will, this will end. Um, but when the ambulances came, uh, we, you know, the atmosphere changed and somebody said, it's the Syrian Red Crescent, not the Red Cross. Um, and, so, and that was, you know, that's quite a subtle difference um, because a lot of the activists in the Free Syrian Army were telling us, this doesn't look as good as the Red Cross coming. And then eventually we, we, there was a big debate and the situation in the, in the, in the room got really heated. And we were like, we didn't know what to do. And we eventually said to the doctor, you know, what shall we do? And the doctor, the head of the mission from Damascus, who'd been sent by Assad to get us in the ambulances and take us out, leaned towards me and said, do not get in the ambulance. And then he was like, yo, come on, you have to come with us. Do not get in the ambulance. And he told us quite clearly, if you get in the ambulance, you'll be executed and you'll be thrown and said it was an ambush. Um, so we said, bye. And the ambulances drove off. And I mean, I think Edith would agree that was probably the worst feeling in the world was to, to see and hear the ambulances driving off. And, you know, we didn't know we'd just made the biggest mistake of our lives. But I think in hindsight, it was probably a, it, it was really complicated at this moment because um, the William Daniels, my colleague, was in contact with the French embassy, uh, with, with the French ambassador, uh, Eric Chevalier, who came back from France at this time to try to find an, uh, an is, init, uh, solution for us. But he couldn't achieve to enter Baba Amar neither, as the Red Cross was neither allowed to enter the, the neighborhood. So... It was complicated. We thought that it might be the, the only hope we have to escape from this nightmare. But in the same time, as Paul said, the guys were threatening us, were warning us to come with them. And uh, uh, I didn't tell you, but I met some of them, some of the guys who were in the mission then in Gaziantep in Turkey, and they told us that we were lucky not to take the ambulance because it was an ambush for, for sure. We never achieved to arrive to Damascus safely. So after this last hope came, uh, went, sorry, we didn't have uh, any other option than to wait and then to wait with the other civilians in, in Babama. We didn't have any food. We didn't have any electricity. We didn't have nothing and the doctors were trying to give us some pills some stuff for the for the pain but they didn't have anything neither no that no, was pretty dark dark times and uh, on the following day they organized not only for us but for all the civilians injured in homes uh, and all the civilians still living in homes um, an, es in a, an escape through the tunnel. But it was really difficult to organize more for me because I was still suffering and I can't move anymore. So they had to st stab me on a um, stretcher. stretcher. Uh, sorry for the moves. Um, so 
we had to climb, they had to climb down to the channel with me on the back and trying to walk. We didn't uh, explain that the channel was really difficult, even for someone normal and, uh, and sportive like him, because it was really uh, small, only one meter and 60 centimeters up and only one meter large. So it was really difficult to walk three kilometers like this and with me, carrying me, I'm not really heavy, but uh, on the stretches, it was really difficult. So the guys couldn't achieve up to the end of the tunnel before the attacks started again. And the tunnel was blocked. Yeah. Halfway, the tunnel had been bombed. And the so regime came back, came uh, in the tunnel. <laughs> Apparently then we had to have... Um, just to clarify, because you mentioned it, a couple of things concrete at the beginning. None of the none of the two of you or your colleagues had requested a visa to enter Syria at the time. So technically, they did not have you in the radar. Technically, not. They couldn't have, have us on their radar. But uh, it's obvious that uh, they knew all the foreigners coming to Beirut thanks to their friends at the airport. And then I don't know how they get the information. That's yeah. something I'm still trying to investigate. I think, I think they only put, they had to buy the Sunday Times and go to the center pages and they knew we were there. Yeah, yeah. for Marie Colvin it was easy. Right. Everybody knew. So they knew, they knew exactly where we were. But, for instance, something that you mentioned before as well, you say the Lebanese intelligence had information about targeting journalists in, in Syria. So, in your experience, and both of you have a long experience, is that something that one um, expects from an antagonistic regime? I mean, it was something really new that the journalists were the subject of these kind of considerations. I think it's the first time that we've we've ever had it from such an official source. You know, I think there's in 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 any conflicts, you know, journalists do get killed and journalists do get caught in crossfire. And and sometimes there are you know that there, there are things just go wrong. But I've never really gone into a place where they have they've issued orders on an open radio network to kill journalists, you know, and, and it was, you know, it wasn't just, it was a policy, any journalist, and these are to quote, any journalist found on the battlefield in or around Homs were to be executed and have the bodies, you know, the Lebanese were quite specific about that. So no, it's, I've never, I've never come across that before. It's not the first time I entered in a country legally, but it's the first time, yeah, as he said, we were targeted um, officially. And it's not, not something new, because if you look into the, the past uh, of Syria, what happened in Hama in 82, was the same story. They were targeting the, the journalists, they, they were preventing the journalists to attend the city before the, the cleansing of the city. No one was able to, not a few uh, were able to talk about what was happening at this time in, in Hama. And that's why it's so complicated nowadays to have exact figures of the number of dead people. And now a little bit on, on impunity, which is a huge um, component, a very important component of this tribunal. Well, today we'll learn uh, from Professor Rucker the difference between the state and the regime, and how in a way the state or members of the state can even be victims of the regime after your colleagues were killed in homes. Was any response, any acknowledgement, any attempt uh, for them to not undo, but to to specifically refer to these facts and try to amend them in any way. They, they never say a word about our fact uh, about our, our killings. They never say that they didn't do it. And it's even more the opposite because they try to put a reward on our head. They were uh, offering ten thousand dollars 
for information to find us when we were trying to escape. So the regime never say that they didn't try to, to kill us. On the case of Gilles Jacquier, okay, there is um, controversy and there is difficulty to, to know who targeted him, even if we know. But on our case, there is no doubt. The, the, only, the only kind of official response that I ever heard about from Damascus was that they did an autopsy on Marie and Remy's bodies and they said that they were killed by a, a terrorist nail bomb. And that, that's the only, the, the only thing I ever heard, that they, they, they never acknowledged it took place. And they've never responded, you know, even in the court case that we, we brought in America, they never, they never responded. And when we were watching the news on the official TVs during the time when we were hidden, they were talking about us, saying that we are terrorists, trying to put uh, Syria into danger. So, yeah, they never say, they never claim they didn't target us. Have you been back in Syria since 2012? Both of us, yes. <laughs> yeah, often. Thanks to the brave Syrian who will continue to try to find a way to inform us. That was my next question. How is the situation of the journalists and the people that are f resisting from inside and trying to do this job right now? Um, like when I went back in, there was still, I went, I went in across the, um, Illegally again, unfortunately, because that's the way we do things. But yeah, um, look, you still have to, still have to be very careful. You know, I mean, I don't think either me or Edith will ever be reporting from Damascus anytime soon. But no, there are areas you can get in. But you know, situation if you know, Kamishli was the was the town that we were heading to, and people said to us, "Beware in Kamishli. You turn around one corner, you could." You could be bumping into the S SAA at any any junction, so and that's the, something that you know it wouldn't be good for either of us because although I don't think they officially acknowledged us, I'm sure we're on a list somewhere as people that they would like to chat to. Um, but you know the difficulty is still. It, I don't think anything has changed. It's certainly not got any easier for journalists or media workers reporting out of Syria, in fact, probably, probably a lot worse. Such as the doctors, uh, journalists and citizen journalists are the main targets of the regime since the beginning of the revolution. More than hundreds have been killed trying to put eyes on what's happening nowadays in Syria. And, okay, few foreigners were targeted, were killed, during their trip into Syria. But the main targets, the main victims of this conflict are the local one, the Syrian one, who try to continue to inform it about what's happening in Syria and no one cares. That's why, for me, it's really difficult because, I, I, okay, I continue to go back to Syria, to Idlib and to Raqqa neighborhoods in the north where it's possible to, to work. But there is dozens of journalists, of brave women and men trying to continue to do their work and no one care. And they are killed for their work. They are uh, at, um, kidnapped, imprisoned, tortured, some are released, most of them stayed in jail and the family doesn't have any news about them and no one care. Yeah, but it's after after them events in two thousand and twelve, you know, there was a big. I was in London when when they um, it sent kind of shockwaves through the the journalist world, and I went to a lot of meetings with editors, and and really internationally, on in many ways, the the press pulled back from sending journalists in, and there and you know, so the burden of responsibility and work fell to local journalists, you know, even even more after after what happened. Yeah. And because they were risk averse, they didn't want, you know, their, their own crews. And the people who took on, you know, that they, they were carrying a big load anyway, the local Syrian journalists and activists. 
But that became an even greater burden because then also ISIS and the, the dynamics on the ground changed. It was even more dangerous. So, the, you know, and it, it's, be, it's been always been the case that it's the local citizen journalists and journalists who've suffered. But, you know, when the international press pulls back, as it did, then, you know, they, there's even more of a responsibility on the local people, and they paid the, the, highest, the highest price by far. Unless you have anything else you want to add, I don't have any questions, and thank you very much. Perhaps the panel may have some questions. Yes, uh, I have a question from Eduardo. I don't see the... Oh, okay, start with Eduardo. Good afternoon, and thanks for, for your testimony. Uh, sometimes it's hard to classify journalists, but let me classify you as war correspondent for, for, for the time being, okay? And I would like to ask you, taking into account your experience, your personal experience and your experience as war correspondent, um, probably the answer is an obvious answer, but it's important for the tribunal to introduce this as an evidence, okay? So in your opinion and according to your experience as war correspondents, could you please tell us the importance of having war correspondents in the ground, the importance not only for the people that are out of the conflict, but also the importance for the people that are within the conflict, the people that want to express human rights violations and in this kind of environment is sometimes not possible. And you uh, just mentioned that some uh, press organizations pull back because of the situation and according to your experience and, and, and your work, what would be the consequences? You say something the, the, about the consequences because the, the, and the, the only one who can report are the ones who are there and the risk is higher. But what happened when war correspondents cannot go or the media corporation decided not to send war correspondents? Thank you. Uh, yeah, um, I think, you know, I'm, I'm a, an absolute believer in that, um, the press doing an important job and, and being on the ground. Um, number of reasons. One, that when you're in, in a place like, I'll use Homs because that's what, when you're in Homs, you know, there, there is a certain responsibility that, that the world has and it's a gap that isn't filled. You know, there, are, there were no UN observers there were no any officials on the ground. This was, this was open season for, for a regime to do what they like. And I think the press, you know, does and plays a critical role. And, you know, we are, in many senses, without sounding too grandiose, the eyes and ears of the world in that situation. Because when you have a regime that really wants to do bad things, and they did, you know, there's no getting away from that. They were doing bad things. They wanted to. And it's, you know, this is why they attack the press. It's, if there's nobody there to get this out, the, the local activists, they, you know, and my heart broke for them because they were like, we give the world these stories. We put them out. We risk our lives. We go out every day and we put it out. Sorry. And the world really was doing nothing. And you know, their thing was like, can you try? And we were like, we can try. Um, because they, they just felt that the world wasn't listening to them. And, you know, it was, I was kind of lucky because I worked for a paper that I worked for, and Marie had quite a voice. You know, and we genuinely thought that maybe if we got the story out, we stayed long past it being good judgment and safe. We stayed when we knew it was bad, and you showed up when when it was bad, you know, and, and I, there was a conversation I had with Marie on a Tuesday, and I said, if we don't put something out immediately, this is the night before the attack, um, 
I said, then we're not going to be alive on Friday to tell this story. That was a conversation we had, and that's just before you guys showed up and we did the interviews. We knew it was over. You know, it was, it was closing in. And so we thought, you know, we had a responsibility if we weren't going to get a paper out, a story for the paper that Sunday that we went on CNN, the BBC, and Channel 4 and told a story. And, you know, here you see a direct correlation between the press getting the story out. We went live from Baba Amra, which absolutely drove the regime crazy. And it's, I think it highlights exactly why we need a free press working in there. Because we did the story that night, and six hours later, Remy and Marie were dead as a direct consequence of us telling. You know, we had the temerity to broadcast live from, from hell. And, you know, you saw what the regime did. And that's when a regime is like that, they, the last thing they want is any form of accountability or any form of witnesses that will carry some weight. And, you know, it's, it's, it still tortures me that it took, you know, that I kind of remember where that the Western journalists aren't always the best journalists, you know, and the most honorable in, in many fields. But I think by the time it gets to people willing to go into them places and stay there, and I think that's when, you know, that's, to me, that's what we should be doing. And when we're not allowed to do that, the world will be quite a, a lot darker place if we can't get in and tell them stories. Did that, did that even vaguely answer your question? I'm not sure. Might have done a bit. Um, I think that, as our colleague be before the lunch said, if we don't say what's happening in Syria, only the winner, only the regime, if, even if I don't consider him as a winner, will tell the 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 story about Syria, about the revolution. So we have to continue. We have to continue to go there, and that's why I continue to go to Idlib and Raqqa as soon as, as often as I can, to tell about the disappeared, to tell about the families of disappeared people who are trying to find their relative after ten years of. Um, without any news about them, to tell about the bombings of hospital, because nowadays we seem to discover that the Syrian regime and the Russian regime, moreover, are targeting hospital schools, but they did it before in Syria. So we have to continue to tell the story about the Syrians, to tell the story about the, what's happening in Syria, because otherwise, even if I don't trust the UN to implement a court for the Syrian civilians. I think that we have to know what's up, what happened in Syria for 10 years. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, so uh, my question to you is, you know, international journalists, when they go into situations of conflict, because you work for an international media organization, you, they have your back, even though there are circumstances like this that people get into. And I'm very glad that you have acknowledged the role of the local journalist because quite often this is not acknowledged. We know for a fact that uh, uh, local journalists put themselves out for people from big new media organizations, but they don't necessarily, it's not a question of payment, but they don't necessarily have people who will say, we have your back too, yeah? So my question to you is, in the case of these particular journalists who did help you during your, this incident that you described, and later, your organizations for whom you wrote or filed stories, did they look out also for those journalists? I mean, as in Afghanistan, for instance, after August 15th, uh, many of the local journalists there were helped by the international journalists to get out because there was no way they could. They, they were also targeted, after all, because they had worked with international journalists. And I would presume that in this case, too, the Syrian authorities would have known which are the people that are helping you and you and others. Uh, was there any way that your media organizations, which had the resources, conveyed that, you know, we can help out if these people want to leave or if there's any way we can get their back? So Whale, who was one of the most 
fantastic, honourable people I've ever met. Who was um, he was an ex Syrian commando, and uh, he volunteered to to help us. We tried to pay him, and he said, "If you pay me, I will resign." So we did everything we could to slip him money, and he just didn't didn't want a thing. But he was injured in the attack, um, and you know the, the the time came when it was looking like nobody was going to make it out. We said, you know, go. You can. He was from Baba Amre. He knew the area. He could have walked out. He had a damaged arm. He wouldn't. Um, but when we escaped, you know, we spent a year working with Whale to get him from from where he was hiding. We got him to Beirut. Then through the UN, we managed to get him out to Norway. Um, um, not, not Norway, Finland. He wished it was Norway. Effing Finland, as he likes to call it. Um, but yeah, we got him to uh, we got him to Finland, where he's now happily married with a baby. And um, you know, we we did what we could. And we stood by him. He stood by us. So. Um, for the French, they are really well known now to help uh, their workers. You were talking about Afghanistan. Were really the, the French government were really reluctant to support the Afghanis who worked for the French army. So and I will not say a word about the fixers who worked for the French journalists. So French are not really good at welcoming people uh, who were supporting their um, nationals, army and, and journalists. So. I couldn't say that my country will support uh, Syrian journalists, but we are trying to do that. We have to say a word about Al Jed, who, uh, who was killed. He was one of the activists with us in Baba Amar, and he was killed, arrested and killed in Syrian jail because he helped us. So thanks to him, we are here, but we owe him our lives. So, and there is hundreds of Syrians who are continuing to help and support journalists and to support the way we will know the truth about Syria. Thanks to them, we have videos about the bombings on civilian neighborhoods, on hospitals, on schools, because they are the only one who continue to do the archives in case if there is a justice. Question. Sorry, I didn't, didn't see you. Yes, Gil. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's hard to imagine what a nightmare it was. And so I, I offer my uh, condolences for the loss of your colleagues and uh, a great deal of respect for your courage and, and your mission. Um, I've seen some data about uh, nearly 200 journalists um, killed in, in non-state areas. I was wondering if you'd like to comment on that. Do you, do you know any of, of the people who, who suffered uh, uh, murder or ex execution or other kinds of uh, uh, violations in uh, the Northeast and the Northwest under ISIL? <clears throat> under ISIL? Um, yeah, that's it. Yeah, I had uh, yeah, quite a few. Steve, Stephen Sotloff, who was executed. Um, particularly good friend of mine, James Foley, who was beheaded by ISIS. Um, John Cantley, who was taken prisoner with James. Um, John was kind of forced for a, about a year to make these horrendous pro ISIS propaganda videos. Um, you know, and we kind of watched him slowly die, basically. Every video we saw, he was thinner and thinner and looking more like he was near the end. And then uh, they were taken together, James and John. And we saw, we, you know, I got a call one, one morning saying, have a look on YouTube if you want, but James has been executed. Um, John, we, we did our best. I think a huge collaboration between every intelligence agency on the, involved in the region to try and find out where ISIS had John, but we lost track and 
I wouldn't like to speculate what happened, but we we never heard from John again. Gosh, and that, you know, I'm 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 sure there's more. Really, there seems to be an an, an incredibly long list of people we lost in in Syria. But they were they were the immediate ones who sprang to mind. And and there is also the Syrian ones who are continuing to talk about what's happening on the ground because it's not because we forgot to look what's happening in Syria, that the bombing stops. As I said before, the civilians are still under bombs of the regime, under threatening of the uh, ISIS. So there is a lot of uh, reason to die nowadays in Syria, without talking about the lack of food, lack of medicine, lack of everything. So. Hundreds of uh, Syrians are continuing to die in Syria, trying to continue to give us uh, the information about what's going on there. And they are still trying to do their work on one part under the control of uh, the Kurds, who are not com completely uh, letting them do their work. And on the other part, it's even worse because they are under the authority of uh, a former group related to the Battle Nusra of Al Qaeda. So brave women and men continue to do their work without any international support. Could could I just follow up on that? Um, I've I've done some work uh, with, with and and about the Kurds in 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 uh, Turkey. I, I've never been in Syria, but I have a great admiration for. Um, their confederalism and their uh, pro-women agenda, etc. But and so I was surprised to learn that apparently there have been quite a few journalists killed in in those areas. Do, do you know who's doing the killing? Is the Kurds or others? And why do you, if if you have any intelligence on on why they're being killed and and how, and indeed. Um, what else is being done? And what you, Edith, you said that they weren't completely allowed to uh, operate independently. If you could uh, develop that, I'd, I'd appreciate it. Uh, there is a lot of reason to die in Syria, as I said before. But uh, in the eastern part, there is the Turks bombings, the ISIS attacks, the American and French attacks during the war against ISIS. Uh, what else? So many reasons to die. Russian one, sorry. Uh, and nowadays, uh, 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 I think that for the Kurds who are trying to control this large area on the eastern part of Syria, it's really difficult because the area is still under attacks, as I said, but ISIS. And they are still alone, the American left, the French are not really helpful neither. So they have to fight against um, anonymous uh, enemies and they have to find a way to cope with this lack of support. So um, it's difficult for them. But it's, there is still some difficulties, some fightings between the Arabs and the Kurds over there. But there is a long story. We have no time for that. Thank you. Uh, first, thanks for your testimonies. Uh, if I understood well, you said that you tried to open a judicial case in America yeah? uh, for Mary and I think Remy. And what happened with that initiative uh, what do you can talk about initiatives to bring justice in these killings first? And the second question, if if you can talk more about the current disinformation campaigns about Syria, mm -hmm. what how the, these are operating? Thanks. Okay, well, um, the, the, the American case it was a civil lawsuit brought by Maria's family against the against the, the, the Syrian state. Um, we couldn't bring it in everybody's name because Marie was American and 
to do with the American legal system because uh, she was murdered by a state that officially is, who sponsors terrorism. Cecilia is a state sponsor of terrorism. The case could be brought in the states, um, and it was brought really, you know, not not in any great expectation that you know there was going to be an um, the kind of they were going to show up in court with this lawyer which would have been nice, but it was never going to happen. It was brought basically as a math point of principle. We could, therefore we did. Um, and it was, you know, I mean, it was incredibly good exercise in gathering evidence. And, you know, we we, we put it up there and, and, and we won. You know, and the, the government, you know, the judge turned around and said, that, you know, a, a official verdict of the, the D.C. judge was that, you know, it was a state-sponsored assassination of a journalist to silence the press, which is what we were... You know, what I had, Edith, all of us had said all along, the attack was deliberate. It wasn't an accident, the attack on that media centre. Yeah, it's kind of, it's slightly not the best feeling in the world, winning a case in, a, in, a, in America about you, but it wasn't about us. It was about bringing, trying to shine the spotlight on what this regime were doing and how they were treating, not just the not just the rest, you know, how they were treating their own people. You know, this was a government who were murdering its own children. And it was any way we could shine the spotlights on. Um, and, you know, the evidence stood up, and that evidence is being used in other cases now, which was another, it was a proven ground for the evidence. So it was the beginning and you know there are a lot of you know there, there are more and more cases of of, of legal actions against the, the, this regime and i just think the more the better you know every single one adds a little bit more weight and um, so this you know there's a there's a, a real danger and i think this was one of my main reasons is to get this case and to win it was there's this creeping rehabilitation of this murderous regime back into the international community as if you know collective amnesia is coming over the world and we're going oh well maybe they're not so bad you know he's maybe we could do business damn right he's bad they are murderous animals and they should not be rehabilitated by anybody into any international bodies organizations they should be where they belong with the Russians as outcasts and pariahs until they stop the killing and they acknowledge the killing and there's justice for the people who were killed. I've been criticizing French authorities before, but on this particular point on justice, I'm really proud of what we are doing. Thanks to amazing French lawyers, thanks to Mazen, thanks to others, we managed to put the death of um, Remy and the injuries of uh, Paul and me to the court against, for crimes against uh, humanity and war crimes. And judges, after several years of uh, investigating, are uh, more aware of what's, what happened in Syria and thanks to what we brought, uh, all the archives we showed them. Thanks to the, the activists who helped us, we are about, um, about to say which unit targeted us, where were the base, which weapon they used. So we are building an arc of uh, information and I hope that one day it will be a court, even if they couldn't at attend. But we have to continue our work not to let them um, normalize the Syrian regime because as Paul said, step by step, it's like if um, we forgot what happened to the Syrians. And I'm really um, ashamed because a few years ago, our French president, re newly re-elected, re said that uh, Assad is not the enemy of the French. It's, he is only the enemy of the Syrians. And I, I disagree. 
So I think that we have to continue, thanks to the journalists on the ground, thanks to our reports, to inform it about what's happening in Syria, because otherwise, as you said, there is a huge uh, wave of disinformation about Syria. For example, the chemical weapons attack never happened. Uh, the bombings on hospitals never happened. The torture in the Assad jails never happened. And recently, the amnesty they, they proclaimed, we don't, we don't know if who were the, the person they released. We couldn't achieve to have exact names, exact figures, so we have to continue. And uh, you know, don't, with, with regards to disinformation, don't forget that these people who, who, who run these disinformation campaigns, they don't have to prove a thing. There's no onus on them to prove something didn't happen. All they have to do is put enough slightly wrong information into the public arena and confuse people till people, you know, the amount of people who said to me, I just don't know what's happening because there's so much information. And, and that's, a, that's a terrible position to be in when you have to prove something and then all these idiots just have to sit there and pollute the atmosphere with slightly off stories, slightly gray stories, with no onus of proof or burden of responsibility to prove anything. They just have to muddy the water. They have to make the water so people can't see the truth, even though the truth is screaming to get out. They can't see it because there's so much disinformation. That's the danger of disinformation. It's very weak and it's flimsy and it doesn't have to prove a damn thing. Comments? And, and just last, last thing, we, we focused in Europe on the crimes uh, made by the jihadists, but we forgot that the main um, attackers in Syria is still the regime. That among the thousands, hundred thousands of uh, civilians killed in Syria, only 10% were killed by the jihadists. Comment. Yes, Gil. Yes, um, I'm very glad that you've said what you've said about uh, working against the normalization of this regime, because we have a brilliant example of a regime uh, that uh, existed in the Philippines some years ago only a few decades ago. And the son of that uh, dictator, who is himself in many ways uh, a most immoral and criminal uh, character who had the billions to organize his own election on May the 9th, uh, shows the danger of not treating these regimes very seriously and continuing to expose their deeds and their misinformation. So thank you for what you're doing. It's most important. Cheers. We don't have any more questions. Thank you both very much for being part of this.